Thank you. Um, the idea about having a, a workshop on the ECI here was actually has come out of uh, previous uh, council meetings where the ECI has been one of the main issues that is discussed usually at every meeting. Uh, not a lot of people know about the ECI process here in Greece, so we thought that it would be a good opportunity to present the ECI and also tie it in with the issue of dem direct democracy and try to explain the difference a little bit about what is direct democracy and what is participatory democracy. Uh, the the uh, DCI actually came out of the Lisbon Treaty because it, uh, the, the Lisbon Treaty refers to it. So the uh, the actual application of, of this process came about in April of this year, and so far about 12 European citizens initiatives have been registered with the the Commission. However. During this time, the ECI has been faced with a number of problems, uh, mainly that have to do with the online uh, process of, of gathering signatures and, and some other problems that I guess um, our speakers here will refer to them. We, on, on, you know, personally, uh, for my part, I participated in, uh, these, in an ECI which had to do with the welfare of dairy cows. It was ECI number four in the process. Uh, it was registered uh, back in uh, May. But it, it's also the first ECI which was withdrawn due to the fact that there were all these problems that we had to face and we were um, unsure about the future, so we decided to withdraw it temporarily and then probably resubmit it at a later point when we know uh, better how the ECI process will end up uh, working. I have, uh, we have here basically three speakers. Um, my first, uh, I, I would like to introduce uh, MEP Gerald Hefner. Most of you know him. He has been the, I would say, the soul of the ECI process. He has been uh, a parliamentarian who has been identified with the ECI in Brussels. Um, Gerald Hefner has also been one of the founding members of the Green uh, Party in Germany. And he has been, he is the president of Democracy International, which is uh, an NGO. And uh, another NGO, he has been the founder of uh, an NGO called uh, More Democracy. So he is a person who has been uh, dealing with the issue in that for many, many years. So I would like to give the floor to him, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll introduce the other speakers. Okay, so thank you very much for this kind of invitation. Thank you for coming. Thanks for the chance to uh, to speak and exchange a bit about uh, democracy, direct democracy, participatory democracy, especially about the European Citizen Initiative. Let me uh, start with some more general uh, remarks, and before I then come to to the ECI in specific. Uh, Speaking a bit generally, I would say that the, the question of democracy, of modern democracy, is the core question of all politics. So also, me, I didn't start with democracy questions. I started with the uh, environment movement. I was protesting, demonstrating, doing lots of things. But in the end, we always realized that we could not decide. It's the politicians who decide. That was the reason why we decided to found a party out of this movement, the Green Party. But we knew from the very beginning that it's not enough to tell people, vote for us and then we will solve all problems. Democracy is much more. And democracy is not just passing away your vote and then being passive. Democracy means that citizens can but also citizens have to inform themselves, have to engage, and citizens must have a say in politics. And democracy is nothing that is fixed, that is ready one day. It's not like a machine or something. Democracy has to live. 
it's like a living organism that has to grow and to develop with the citizens, with our knowledge, our capability, and also with the changes in society. So what was enough democratically seen 100 years ago is not enough now. So for example, 100 years ago in my country, women couldn't vote. We had already the right for men to vote, but not for women. For me today, it's completely incredible to, to understand how this could be possible that uh, men argued, uh, yes, we must have a right to vote, but only for males, because females are not capable of voting. You can read articles and scientific explanations why women are not capable to vote. It's more or less the same arguments that are now used against direct democracy. Very many people think that it's only politicians who are capable to decide, but that's not true. And we can prove the opposite by empiric results. Wherever we have managed to establish direct democracy, we have better results. We have better lawmaking. We have more information uh, amongst the citizens, because it's a huge difference when you know on 5th of November, I will have to decide, I will have a say. Then you inform yourself more and you discuss the issue more. Then when you know, oh, I cannot do anything, I have no chance, it's them who decide. So it leads to more information, it leads to more discourse within a society, more debate. Uh, it leads to more engagement and many more citizens engage than in political parties, which is very interesting because, for example, in Germany, before we could introduce that in Germany, all my colleagues from other parties always said we don't need direct democracy because those who are interested in politics are already in the parties and nobody else will use that. So we make empiric studies after introducing it, who uses it, and in 90% of the cases it's people that are not uh, active in political parties, but very often it's citizens that engage on one issue against water privatization, against the nuclear power plant, or whatever, they have a success in the end, and then they run for the next elections, they form a party or whatever, so quite often it leads to citizens that then engage regularly, but it starts with issues, and this is incredibly important, I think, especially for young people, who quite often refrain from uh, becoming a party member, but to engage on specific issues. And it's important that we have in a society possibilities to engage on issues and to have a success on that. So the general idea would be that today, in a society of today, it's not enough to vote every fourth or fifth year and for the rest of the time be mere spectators. It's necessary that the sovereign, the sovereigns are the people, that we the people always are the sovereigns, which means that we vote for politicians, for parliaments, and they decide, but when we say, no, stop, we see this different, here we want to have a debate, and we want to decide ourselves, then this must be possible. So that's direct democracy. And when we now come to the ECI, the ECI is an instrument not of direct, but of participatory democracy. But the background, why we introduced it, maybe I should say the ECI did not fall from heaven. It was invented by a group of members of Mere Demokratie, this uh, organization, and the Initiative and Referendum Institute in Amsterdam. We together, so citizens, engaged citizens, NGOs, we made a workshop on what can we do uh, to make the European Union more democratic. We made a couple of proposals. One of this was the European Citizen Initiative. It was the only one we managed to introduce into the Lisbon Treaty. The others, uh, for the others, we could not get a majority yet, but they are still on the agenda. So now we have the European Citizen Initiative, and when I became a member of the Parliament, I uh, immediately worked on establishing this property in the European Union because it was already in the treaty, but it was not established. There was no regulation, nothing. And then the problem is that the European Parliament cannot make regulation by its own. We, can, we don't have the right uh, for an initiative. Uh, so we have to wait for the Commission to come up with a proposal. And the Commission came up with a terrible proposal. So this is people who never in their life 
did any initiative, they never collected signatures, they don't know what it means, they are just a bit afraid of this could cause too much trouble or too much change, so they uh, wanted to make it very, very bureaucratic. It's more the expression of fear uh, um, in, in, uh, it comes to citizens than to invite citizens to, to share political decisions, to share their proposals and so on. So then I became, after a, a fight of uh, nine months, I in the end became rapporteur of the European Parliament on the Citizen Initiative together with three other rapporteurs, so it was four of us that were working on this, and we could manage to change the regulation uh, a lot. But in the end, then, we again had to go to the trilogue with the Commission and with Council. So it's important for you to know that what is now uh, the regulation, this is not what the European Parliament, and especially it's not what uh, we, the Greens, wanted. It's a compromise. And to come only to the basic uh, elements of this compromise, so uh, it says that when one million signatures are collected throughout Europe, then uh, you can put something on the agenda and the European Commission has to deal with it. It does not say that the Commission has to adopt the proposal. The Commission is free to adopt it, not to adopt it, or it's also the Commission free to do nothing. In the regulation from the Commission, the idea was one million signatures. Citizens collect 1 million signatures, which means uh, more than 2,600 signatures a day, which is a lot of work. If you think about how much emphasis, how much time and work and all this, this needs, it's a lot. And in the end, the Commission said, we will write them a letter whether we will do anything or not. And you can imagine in 95% of the cases, they will say, thank you, we will do nothing. So I said this is not acceptable at all. You cannot uh, collect one. You cannot put on one side of the way one million signatures on the on the other side. Of that. This is impossible. So it must enter into a dialogue. So the proposal was to have an official hearing in Brussels, uh, in front of the Parliament and the Commission, and to discuss the issue with Parliament and Commission to, to see what can be done. And so, on. so this is one of the achievements we made, we brought in the hearings. Another achievement was, the Commission said, uh, we will not say whether this is admissible or not until 300,000 signatures have been collected. Then we will stop it, we will have a look at it, and then we will say, okay, no, sorry, you have to change some wording, you have to rewrite it, start again, which is completely crazy. This would be as if you would plan to go from Athens to Brussels, and the Commission would say, okay, we will decide whether you can do that, but we will decide only when we have reached, let's say, Vienna. When we are in Vienna, we will say, go back and start again. So as an NGO, you cannot do that. You cannot collect 300,000 signatures without knowing whether this is possible, and then come back to those who signed and said, I'm sorry, uh, the Commission wanted us to change the text. Could you sign again? If you do this two or three times, citizens say, couldn't you uh, uh, make this clear in advance? We are not going to sign anymore. Is it, are you, do you think we are fools? So, a lot of completely bureaucratic things. I asked them why they wanted to do it only after 300,000. They said, we have no money. We have not enough stuff to check uh, when it is submitted. So we want to have a rat's race. Uh, we want to see who makes 300,000, and only then we want to look at it, and many other things. So I now, no, I, I think I, I come to two or three important points, and then I pass to, to Daniela, uh, and, and maybe you then come to uh, how it is now, uh, how the situation is, how many uh, were brought in, how many failed, and so on. Uh, maybe uh, I should only stress, uh, two more points. One is we uh, a great achievement was that we were successful in introducing online collection of signatures, which was not possible before, so you can collect, collect it online now. But the Commission made the online collection system so complicated that it doesn't work. It does not work up to now. Uh, so all the initiatives that started had problems with, uh, with uh, technically 
uh, doing this. It cost them month and a lot of money. And I spoke then with uh, Commissioner Shevchovic and said uh, this is impossible because the time runs. You have only 12 months for the collection of signatures. Time runs, but it doesn't work. So then he wrote them a letter. The commission will stop the time. The time will only count after the problems have been solved. They couldn't solve the problem. Then they said, okay, we will find a hosting solution for them, for some of the initiative. So now they host some of the initiative. The commission does that technically, but not all of them. And they don't. They say we will not do this in future anymore, which means some initiatives uh, have benefits, others are discriminated. It's completely impossible if you have, as I did, made legislation on participatory democracy in many states, in many countries, uh, I've never come up with such a situation. So it's a great new achievement. It's the first instrument of transnational, uh, the first instrument of participatory democracy on the transnational level. It's an invitation to the citizens to use it, but the bureaucracy has implemented it so terribly that until now it has been should work from the 11th of November. More and more initiatives now uh, made it run, one made it run by itself, it was right to water because they have a lot of money and technical stuff. They are supported by the trade unions, the European trade unions, and others now accepted the hosting uh, solution by the Commission in Luxembourg, but this is not a good solution for the future, so we still work on that. And I now pass to uh, Daniela, ending with saying, please, although there are problems and difficulties. Please have in mind that this is the first instrument that gives citizens a first, let's say, element of say in Europe. Make use of it. Use it. And the discussion whether it is enough or it is not enough, I would always say it's not enough, but it's the beginning, it's the first step towards more participatory, more deliberative, and more direct democracy in Europe. We have to use it, and we have to look for further instruments. But if it's not used, uh, then it will be more difficult to call for more democracy. So please use it, and use it as an instrument to create discourse from the bottom in Europe, not only top-down policy, but from the bottom up discourses in Europe. Thank you. She is a member of the Bulgarian Greens from the party of Zelenite. She has been involved um, in uh, local politics for a long time. She also has been involved with the issue of local direct democracy and particularly with the uh, referendum for the uh, Burgas Alexandrupolis uh, oil pipeline, which actually uh, ended successfully and it was cancelled. So, Daniela. Good evening everyone, I'm happy to be here. It's a lot of um, challenging uh, experience to speak about democracy in a country which is the birthplace of democracy. And it feels also like coming back to the crime scene where democracy was conceived. So, And besides, democracy was direct in its first prototype in, um, in Greece. Um, so I will uh, try to give some uh, uh, context to the European Citizens Initiative um, and uh, give you also some examples um, out of my own experience uh, with uh, direct democratic practices as far as they are possible in my own country and um, touch on some aspects of uh, direct democracy specifics in the region mainly in the former communist blocs a block um, of former communist countries. <coughs> okay. I like this thought, freedom is participation in power. This is um, ascribed to uh, Marcus Cicero. He said that 2,000 years ago in the Asian times, 
but um, um, we um, understand on election day that actually we have the power on election day when, when we delegate it to our representatives whom we elect. And actually in between elections we do not have uh, much participation in power or maybe even none, no participation in power. Um, electing representatives is of course the uh, pillar of uh, democracy and of um, its uh, current form representative democracy. Um, direct democracy is electing uh, solutions, not people, not um, representatives um, deciding on issues. Um, maybe most of you um, know the difference between uh, people who are involved in research uh, make this difference between participatory and direct democracy. In participatory, you participate in the drafting of decision, you can influence it, but you never make the final decision. So participatory forms are forms like uh, public discussions, public consultations, uh, public boards for monitoring something, but um, uh, citizens who participate there do not make the final decision. And this is the main difference between participatory and direct democracy. The existing forms in the world, um, somewhat 150 years in Switzerland, the existing forms uh, which we know today of direct democratic participation are referendum, initiative, and recall. I will just uh, define in two words every one of them. Uh, referendum is, uh, has a European meaning and American. American meaning is very limited. A referendum is called only uh, voting on legislature that is drafted by the, the elected legislators. Well, uh, we in Europe use referendum for any popular vote. When people vote on issues, we say it's a referendum. <laughs> initiative is, um, again, uh, a legislative proposal, but in this case it is drafted, it is proposed by the people, by the citizens, uh, by some initiative uh, steering committee. And depending on whether citizens vote, finally, after collecting the signatures in support of the initiative, whether they vote on it, it's uh, direct or indirect. Uh, if it is referred to uh, the legislative body, then it is indirect. Like the European Citizens Initiative, it is a kind of indirect initiative because we propose something, but we uh, wait for the Commission to propose legislation and for the European Parliament to vote it in. And recall is uh, something that is um, controversially direct democracy because this is just the opposite of elections. You just, uh, if you have this mechanism, you can end uh, prematurely the mandate of your elected representative if, uh, for reasons like uh, misconduct, um, corruption, and so on. And uh, some countries do have it. Uh, recently, the Romanians voted in something that was called referendum, but it was actually recall in July, um, a recall of their president, and they are unique in this, uh, that they have um, um, this right, uh, people can vote on the recall of the president. Okay, direct democracy is on the rise, um, especially with this crisis, we see representative government, we see failures everywhere, we see that representative government is not yet accountable enough. And if uh, deciding directly on issues give us uh, more power and uh, checks and balances on representative government, then we have to try to have more of this. Uh, European integration historically has been a great stimulus for national referenda in relation to accession and to different uh, integration issues. You know, on some treaties, some countries have taken a popular vote, some several times. Uh, because of that, people speak also of never randoms when you ask and ask the same question again, like the case with the Lisbon Treaty and the Irish. It becomes a never random, and finally. Finally, you win. Um, 
of course, Switzerland uh, with their consensual democracy, uh, with the direct democracy is a staple. It's not something exotic like in my country. The ideas of referendum and initiative are very exotic for, in Bulgaria and elsewhere. Um, so half of the um, national referendums that were ever held worldwide happened in Switzerland. Of course, they have on, a lot of them also at national level. Uh, USA, just a little uh, remark here. Um, the uh, presidential elections uh, that uh, were on uh, Tuesday, uh, because of the glamour of the presidential institu institution, you get little publicity usually on uh, ballot measures. And there are always a lot of ballot measures on election day because uh, specific of American direct democracies that they uh, have referendums on the same day when they elect representatives uh, on a state level or national. So uh, in this case on Tuesday they had 174 referendums on 174 issues. Uh, issues like um, gay rights, gay marriage, marijuana, new taxes, and a lot of others. Um, Central and Eastern Europe is a special case, um, not that I live there, <laughs> um, but because we are coming out of an era that is uh, for which typical was uh, top-down political communication. This was uh, totalitarianism and command economy. Uh, command politics, centralized. So it is not in the political culture of these countries, neither of the elite, elite nor of the people, to be active and to try these ways of directly um, making decisions on issues. And really, political elites are very reluctant to share power with the, uh, with the citizens. On the other hand, the citizens are not so uh, willing to take their own responsibility. They have been for half a century on the recipient side. They have received social um, uh, services, goods and so on. So uh, this explains why uh, we have also less activism also in protesting in Central and Eastern Europe than uh, um, in the older democracies. By the way, recently a, a, a Greek delegation uh, came to Bulgaria to a very um, um, to a region that was in turmoil because of a new gold mine that they planned to open, and uh, the local people told uh, uh, the Greek um, uh, MEP, Mr. Kursovos, uh, they told him, "Why don't you bring some uh, Greek know-how of protesting? We know how to. We want to." <laughs> we want to protest in a better and more efficient way. So we are having these problems also with protesting, and this is, there's a, there are empirical studies that prove that. And really, um, at the heart of the changes uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, in my country, Bulgaria too, was some environmental issues. They uh, very much catalyzed the um, uh, falling apart of the old system. And now these uh, um, similar environmental issues, uh, issues that concern people's health and environment, are like a motor for uh, the interest to direct democracy. More and more people get interested because they want to be informed, because they want to um, to give their consent before some investment project starts somewhere that impacts the environment and their health. And this is what is called uh, FPIC, I think, free prior informed consent, that is part of many conventions. Um, you see, um, I've taken only one um, figure there. It's about the Czech Republic that two thirds of their referendums. Uh, they had about 100 uh, attempts to hold referendums, of which 81 uh, happened, and two-thirds of them were on environmental issues. Also, in my country, the three, uh, by the way, Bulgaria hasn't had national referendum for 40 years, so, but on a local level we have had some, 
and three major referendums that happened on a local uh, municipal level were uh, gained on an environmental issue because this uh, uh, crude oil pipeline, Burgas Alexandropoulos, in which three countries participated, Russia as a supplier of oil, and Bulgaria and Greece as the transit countries. Burgas is in uh, Bulgaria, Alexandropoulos is a port in, uh, in Greece, northern Greece. Um, of course, this was taken as an onslaught on the um, rights of the communities there. It was, uh, there was no environmental guarantees, no funds, it was a bad deal. So uh, people started self-organizing and we held these referendums which were finally two of the three were invalid because of a very high participation quorum. But finally they played their role and at the end of the day um, exerted political pressure on the new government of Bulgaria so they had some political value and this project was uh, cancelled. Of course the crisis had a part in this. This is a picture from the public discussion in Alexandria because uh, a lot of uh, the things we did was in uh, cooperation, in partnership with our Greek colleagues. We were really connected by the pipe, vir virtual pipe. <laughs> okay, I already mentioned that uh, my country is not a good example of direct democracy and we are almost the only one country in the last few enlargements that did not uh, put any question of the accession and integration to the popular vote. This is nothing to be proud of. And besides, we had very, very high bars, very high thresholds for to overcome in order to initiate something, like initiative for a referendum. I uh, used this picture for another presentation, uh, especially for it, um, uh, it plays very well with German audience because because it's about achievement in sports. Um, well, this is Tekta Kostadinova, a Bulgarian athlete, and she uh, is still the holder of uh, world uh, high jump record for women. So some Bulgarian women can jump very high, but our political system have, has even higher bars that we cannot overcome, and this will be just a short uh, list of some of them. For example, for example, to initiate a referendum, you have to collect 500,000 uh, valid signatures in a population of uh, less than 8 million. By the way, just to compare, a similar number of signatures uh, have to be um, collected in California, which is 30 million and more. And besides, we have a unique requirement for um, validation the result of the referendum. The uh, participation, the turnout has to equal the turnout of the previous elections. So uh, now, for a national referendum, it's more than 60%, which is terrible. And it has proven absurd because, for, for example, one village made a local referendum and according to this law, they have an invalid referendum. Their turnout was 73%, but according to the law, they have to have 82%. In the last local elections, they had a turnout of 82%. And because of that, 73% of the people cannot make decision because they are not enough. And can we call this democracy? Another new thing that is good but still uh, uh, underused is a national initiative that, um, that and local also that resembles the European Citizens Initiative. We've collected signatures to try to amend some um, pieces of legislation. Nobody paid attention. Um, the parliament didn't respond. Yes. Yes. Okay, I'll be sure. Okay, now we are facing the uh, first in 40 years referendum, and it will be a referendum on nuclear power and a new nuclear uh, power station in Bulgaria. It's scheduled for the 27th of January next year, and uh, um, we will be looking for some support by our colleagues here. 
because all the uh, parliamentary parties are pro-nuclear and only the Greens in Bulgaria can do something to inform the public about the threats of nuclear. This is how uh, many signatures look when they are submitted. And I just wanted to uh, uh, bring, um, bring up one important issue about uh, as an effect of a badly designed uh, direct democratic system. When you have very high bars to overcome, then only people who have the resources can overcome it. And these are the old, grand old parties like the uh, Bulgarian Socialist Party, 100 years of history, branched out. They over overcame this bar of 500,000 signatures and they call this referendum. So actually because of these uh, uh, barriers, uh, direct democracy does not empower people but empowers some parties and is being used for different purposes. For example, in Greece, this um, attempt to call a referendum on the rescue package last year was in fact dealing with a hot potato because the government didn't want to take responsibility. Also, in the case of the recall of uh, the, the Romanian president, uh, two parties were uh, in conflict. They were trying to use this democratic tool to resolve their conflict. And uh, some parties, like the Bulgarian Socialist Party, are using this for facelifting or for mobilizing the electorate for the upcoming elections. Uh, the picture down there is a nationalistic party. They collected signatures for uh, against Turkey. No, not to become a member of the European Union. Okay, and finally my message, um, message um, from all these uh, examples is that in our countries we have to strive to uh, create a better environment for direct democracy, um, to improve people's political culture and also to improve legislative environment. Uh, we have a reasonable number of signatures.